I can't see that from where I am, so the, the, the glories of projectors and X windows. The person who, I, I want to make sure that when I die and go to hell, I am in a special part of hell where at least I am poking the person who wrote X Randar with a stick for all eternity. Because, um, boy. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about Pledge uh, in OpenBSD. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, and some new things that we're doing. Uh, how Pledge is evolving in OpenBSD and the direction it's going. Uh, I'm going to go through kind of what it is, how it works, um, how we're using it, uh, and, and how it's used uh, in, our, in our tree to, to, you know, basically make everything a lot safer. Um, some of you, if you're not familiar with um, OpenBSD and Pledge, you may be used to other, and I, I hate to use this word, <clears throat> cough, sandboxing techniques, um, which, which you can more or less say Pledge is kind of one of them, but it, it does operate in a different way than a lot of the other techniques in that this is not something you take a program and then slap around it in a wrapper. It's something that is done by the programmer when writing the program or adapting the program. Um, and I'll give, sort of give you a sense of that and uh, talk about some new things that we're going to have soon and some things that we maybe hope to have less than soon uh, with respect to how we do this. So I'm Bob, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and uh, questions and heckling are usually encouraged. Um, I generally won't, won't, you know, I generally won't, you know, really trash on you if you ask a dumb question unless you're Henning. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's all good. If you want to know something, stick up your hand and ask me. Um, I, with that, onward and upward. So, uh, how did we get here, and how did we have Pledge and OpenBSD? How did this start? The, how did this all start? You know, as usual, it's it's you know conversations with Theo and and rapid rapid hand waving back and forth. But where a lot of this really came from is, as as you may know, uh, an awful lot of things in OpenBSD are privilege separated. So before we had Pledge, before there were the, 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 the newfangled uh, sandboxing techniques or any, notification, any kind of thought to any way of restricting you know, things in a program, uh, the way you did this classically in, in Unix and, and with a lot of other you know, you know, programs was if you could architect your program such that it could be split up into pieces. Okay? You took a program that had to do something privileged and you cut it up into different parts. Okay, and so you had a process over here that served one function, and it ran as a different user than the process than the master process that had privilege and did a limited set of things, and you could restrict things with chroot, um, you could restrict things by having separated users. So initially, OpenBSD's approach to this, a number of years back, was to say let's privilege separate everything we can. And we went through the tree, and an awful lot of daemons were privilege separated. And, and you know, if you go back five or six years in OpenBSD, you more, more probably more than ten now. You, but you see this slow profusion of underscore users that got added to the default install. So you'll see like underscore NTPD, underscore PPPD, underscore a whole bunch of things for all these daemons and services that people looked at, said, hey. This is a valid technique that makes things a lot safer. And let's re-architect this program so that it's privilege separated. So instead of a monolithic daemon, NTPD, running as root, you do something like this. And so if you think about OpenBSC NPTD, NTPD, there are three processes. Okay? And I'm not talking about pledge yet. That's on the slide. But OpenBSC NTPD has a master process that starts up and runs as root. It has to in order to be able to root or change user ID, because that's, that's the rules in Unix. Um, and the master process, once it starts and sets up the other workers that are going to do a task, it really just has one job. It communicates to those other workers via a pipe. They send each other messages to say, hey, do this for me. Give me the answer back. Hey, do this for me. Give me the answer back. And the master process, only, but other than talking to the workers, has one job. Set the system time. It's NTPD. Okay? So once, it, once somebody does the work, figures out what the time is supposed to be, tells the master, hey, yo, set the time for me, it sets the time. That's it. That's all it does. So the only thing being done as root is setting the time. That's why privilege separation is a win. 
you don't have root doing all of this crazy stuff, like bringing an NTP packet off the internet, parsing it, looking for options, waiting for the next horror show that the NTP RFC, RFC crowd finally adds to the protocol. We never implemented those. I know, <laughs> and we probably never will, and they'll never finish. But <laughs> um, so if you think about that, uh, an awful lot, and then this, the NTP is the internet speaking process. It actually talks to the internet, and it parses uh, NTP packets that it gets off the internet. So it gets the NTP responses, which could be considered hostile input, because I, I can make a hostile UDP, or a hostile thing that flings NTP UDP packets at you all day long, and see what happens when you receive them. Okay, so. That is not done as root, it's done as the NTP user. And there's another user that actually does all the DNS requests <laughs> in a separate process, that has access to the DNS infrastructure. The NTP user does not, it's in a true root. So that's the fundamentals of privilege separation, just to review that. When we started with pledge, pledge was a way to make these more secure. Because if you think about it, just on its own, okay, I've got this NTP user, and that's good, it's true rooted. The DNS user, not so much. But even still, do we actually want this, this part of the daemon to be compromised if a bug's in the software and somebody can attack it? And so if you look at Pledge, Pledge made it safer. And the way Pledge works, and I, I'm not going to revisit Pledge. It's been, it's been talked about a lot, and you can look up how it calls. But basically, a Pledge is I promise things, OK? And I promise, did I miss a slide? No, I didn't. I'll talk to it anyway. Um, Pledge, pledge works where it takes a subset of POSIX, okay? So a pledge is basically a subset of the standard POSIX functionality, and the programmer puts a call into pledge at an appropriate point in the program, okay? So how pledge works is you go as a programmer, you're working on your program, and you decide, aha, from this point forward, all my program is going to do is standard I.O. and talk to the Internet. It's not going to access the file system. It's not going to memory map things. It's not going to access devices. It's not going to read from different things. A whole number of, of subsets that are possible and defined in pledge. You make that call, and now your program is restricted. Further calls to, may be made to pledge to restrict it further, but you can't open it up again. So if you say, all I'm going to do is talk to standard I.O. and the internet, you can't then say, oh, but wait, I, I also want to talk to the file system afterwards. No, that's not allowed. You can start with, I want to talk to standard I.O., internet, and the file system, and then later on say, hey, I only want to talk to standard I.O. and internet. So that's, that's permitted. Um, what ends up happening is, so if we look here, NTP, all of these, the processes that talk to the internet pledge, NTP, standard I.O., and INET. So the NTP process can talk to the internet. In other words, it can talk to sockets. It can connect. It can do I.O. on sockets. Okay, it can speak TCP IP. Um, the DNS process actually pledges standard I.O. DNS. It can't make sockets. It can't do anything except as regards to resolving DNS functionality. It's the only thing it's allowed to do. Okay? And standard I.O., you need that to talk on a pipe. And guess what? It's talking on a pipe to the master. Okay? And the master process just pledges set time. So not only did we restricts these processes in terms of by design in saying, hey, my root process is only going to do this. It's not going to do other stuff. I've actually effectively made a promise enforced now by the operating system that this is all it's going to do. And most importantly with pledge, what happens when you violate the pledge? Your program crashes. You get a SIG abort. So now, in this scenario, if somehow I manage to find a bug and I manage to try to trick one of these processes into doing something that is not in that pledge. Let's say read a file from the file system, try to open a path, try to, in the case of the master process, open a socket, connect to the internet, do anything like that. What's going to happen is the program will get an immediate SIG abort. It's visible in the debugger. You see a pledge fail. Boom. You can go then use a debugger to figure out what happened, how your program screwed up. But in a nutshell, what this does is it means not externally by inspection, but while the program is being written, the programmer makes a promise. Hey, I am going to not use other functionality from this point forward. I'm going to promise that, and once that promise is made, it can't be taken back. 
And if he violates that promise, the program is shot with a, shot with a SIG abort and it dies immediately. So everybody clear on that? All right. So this is the classic privilege separated model. And this is how we kind of started with Pledge. This is why we started down this road and thought, this is really good, because we can make our privilege separated programs even safer, because we can actually, instead of just by design saying these pieces have only this functionality, we can actually enforce it. Okay? So if, they, if any of these components exceed what we thought they were going to be doing, they get, they get killed. This is a good thing. It makes things a lot safer. So the other thing that Pledge did, then we figured, well, hey, Pledge actually makes privilege drop a lot safer. Well, what's the difference between privilege step and privilege drop? Privilege drop is that thing that, you, this, is, this is the classic example that if you've heard of anything about security from the days of the gro dark gray beards in Unix, one of the first, you know, simple little programs that had a bug that would give you root access remotely, it's been a long time, was ping. Ping had errors and overflows in its parsing of ICMP packets because the way ping works is ping gets a raw socket as root, reads raw ICMP frames off the internet, and parses them to figure out if it's something it should pay attention to, and then generates a packet raw to shove down the raw socket to answer it. You have to be root to get a raw socket. The initial BSD implementations of ping just ran. How did they, how'd they do that? How could you run ping? It's just installed set UID in the file system. So when you run ping, magically, it becomes root on your behalf. It's set UID, and it can get a raw socket, and it can parse packets and do it. And the original ones, obviously, because it was simple, just ran this little program, and effectively with root privilege. They would open a raw socket and go. Once this bug happened, everybody went, Holy shit, how could we let this happen? And discovered that, wait a minute, the only reason we need ping to run as root is, for good reason, root is the only thing allowed to have a raw socket. You have to be root to get a raw socket. So what immediately happened was people in every BSD and Linux operating system took a look at ping and said, oh, what did it do? It did all this stuff, and finally it wanted to do things, and it opened a raw socket as root. And they said, that's dumb pick up this call to open the raw socket as root, effectively move it to pretty much the first line of the program, <laughs> open the raw socket, hold the file descriptor, and then drop privilege. That's priv drop. So I did the thing as root, I did the needful, I got a file descriptor to a, a raw socket, and now I drop privilege. I'm done. So now I don't, I'm not root anymore. And now I go through and I do all my, my string bashing in C to parse a packet and find the offsets in the packet to deal with ICMP and do all the things that ping does. So at that point, they said, oh, Eureka, it's, fin it's fixed forever. We're, we're great because, you know, now it does, it's not a root compromise anymore. But, but hey, wait a minute. <laughs> if it has a bug, it's still a U compromise, right? You know, and you probably have sudo everything because you're on the box in the first place, right? And everybody installs sudo with no password. Uh, so effectively, now what you've done is you've at least made it not a root compromise to, to have hostile ping packets, ping answers coming back to you, but the user could still compromise your user just like it used to compromise root. It's just it's no longer root compromise. So now, well, what can we do differently? Okay, in OpenBSD, now, what effectively happens after uh, ping goes and opens the raw socket as root and drops root? It can't do anything else now, be special, because it's no longer root. It parses its options and figures out what it's going to do. And then, before it does anything else or takes any input from the net or makes anything, it does a pledge. And it pledges standard IO, INET, DNS, meaning it can talk out its socket. It can talk to the internet, it can do internet capable calls, and it can do DNS resolution. It actually doesn't do pledge DNS if you give it a IP address to ping to because it knows it doesn't have to do DNS lookups. So it either pledges standard IO, INET, or standard IO, INET, DNS. At that point now, if the attacker sends you a crafted ping packet designed to take advantage of a bug in your ping implementation and tries to run code on your behalf, all that code can do is talk to the internet, Talk to, a, talk to an already existing socket on standard I.O. and maybe do DNS resolution. If it tries to do anything else, it immediately crashes. Sigabort. 
So all of a sudden now, notice, this makes it a lot safer for the person who invoked ping. Okay? Because if somebody sends you a crafted packet that tries to do something like exec a shell and send the output back to them, or change a file to be set UID root or set UID U, it's going to crash. It's not going to work. Okay? So this is the important part we noticed. Hey, Pledge makes priv drop safer. Well, and why can it do this? Any user can call Pledge. You don't have to be root. You can call Pledge as any user. It doesn't change program behavior. That's the other key point. That's why we let any user call it. Okay? Your program's behavior will not change based on pledge. It could get shot in the head with a SIG abort if it violates the pledge. But if your program is running correctly, no system calls change, no behavior changes for a correctly running program. So there's no harm in letting any user do it. So the next thing we noticed about pledge, and this is cool, this is the really cool part, Pledge brings privilege drop ability to non-set UID programs. We could drop, we could do this fun drop privilege stuff in ping because it started as root. Only root can do set UID to another user. So whereas if you have a program that you just start as yourself, and you say, well, uh, but I'd like to run this, and I'd like to have it talk to the internet, but, but I'd like to run it as another user because I don't want it to compromise me. Well, you can't do that unless you're root or set UID root. Right? So only set UID programs could effectively do the priv drop trick. But with pledge, you can kind of do a lot of privilege dropping without being root. So because any user can call pledge. So programs that don't start as root can't priv drop. But if you think about a program run as normal users, and I'll use an example without showing you the details, Netcat. Okay? Uh, OpenBSD Netcat is a Swiss army knife of stuff. Okay? It can do a lot of things. There are options after options after options. It could do, it can open Unix domain sockets in the file system and talk to them. It can open TCP sockets and talk out. It can be a TCP server and accept connections. It can be a UDP, it can send UDP frames back and forth. It has a whole bunch of options, different things. All of these things actually involve different pledges. Okay? And you need a different pledge to open a socket in the file system. You need a different pledge to write to the file system. You need a different pledge to do DNS lookups, a whole variety of things. So now you figure like, oh, well, but I might be talking Netcat to something nasty. Well, Netcat starts before it parses its options with a very generous pledge. Pledge all the things, actually far from all the things, but, but a lot of things, because it could do any of those things I've listed to you. Then it goes and it parses its options and it figures out, well, what am I actually going to do? Oh, well, I'm going to do TLS on a TCP socket. Well, at that point, it says, okay, I'm going to restrict myself to only INET and file system access. Then I go and I load the TLS certificate that I'm going to use into memory, and then I drop privileges to standard IO INET. And then and only then, I feed the TLS certificate into the libTLS initialization routines, do all the TLS handshake stuff, and actually open a socket connection to where I'm going to and talk on it. But by the time I'm doing that and running a big bag of a lot of open SSL based code, I have already restricted my process so that it can only do things like talk to the internet and standard IO. That's it. So now a bug in those libraries even that could potentially compromise my NC process when somebody sends me a hostile TLS handshake to try to get me even though I'm not root, my program, if they try to do anything more than talk to a pipe or talk on the internet, if they try to open a file, if they try to exec something, if they try to look at my SSH keys, the program is immediately going to crash. And that's a, that's a nice thing. So effectively, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that kind of restriction before without having root to start with. Okay? So this is where we all of a sudden had this, once we figured this part out, and this became wonderful, there's this explosion of activity in OpenBSD. Now we've had, Theo, what's the count? How many programs in base? Uh, over 85%. Over 85% of, over 85% of, base is, of base is pledged. So um, where we get that is you, you all of a sudden notice this plethora of commits where everybody realized that, hey, 
The same kind of tech, remember when I described to you what the old geezers did with pledge, or sorry, with ping, where we move that raw socket open up. We hoisted that code up to the top, did it early, so that we could get it out of the way, and then continue with less privilege. And we needed less privilege. All of a sudden, we realized that now that we have pledge, we can apply this technique to all sorts of programs that were not set UID. And we didn't have, and so there was this massive flurry of code hoisting as everybody realized that, hey, I don't have to do this thing down here after I parse the options and do a whole bunch of dangerous things. I can do it way up here at the top, and then I can pledge that I'm never going to do it again. So when I have to do something like, oh, I'm going to map an executable area of memory, I need pledge exec. But I can do that right up front, have my executable area of memory, and then say I'm never going to do it again. And then if, if the program tries to do it again, it immediately crashes. Okay? <coughs> if I want to do set UID operations, open a device, I can pledge that, oh, I'm, go I'm, going, to work do I'm going to open a device file. But I'm never going to do it again, because I'm only going to open up one at the start. Right? So, when you look, and, and a lot of them started to look like NC. You would start with a wide pledge, and once you figured out what the pro, which, part, which path the program was going to take, you pledged down to only what the functionality of the program was after that. So it takes the Swiss Army knife, and you have a new pledge for every blade in the Swiss Army knife, depending on what the blade is. Okay? So that was cool stuff. And... Uh, so we get to, this is, the, you're going to hear me say it more than once, and I'll say it again now. This is kind of the holy grail, uh, which is Chrome. Chrome is not ours, of course, but uh, we've had uh, our ports developers, who are, are heroes in my book, because they, they keep us honest, and they keep us passing stuff to upstream, and when we find bugs due to pledge or other things, we actually pass the fixes up to upstream, which means even if you're not running OpenBSD, you get the fixes when they take them. So that's a good thing. Um, but Chrome it has been designed to be cut up kind of like for PrivSep. So it, it has these different processes with different functionalities in it already. And so the nice part about that is you can take each of these processes and pledge them differently. And Robert Nagy and the ports guys have a patch that applies to OpenBSD's Chrome. So when you install Chrome from ports, you actually get pledged Chrome. Okay, and remember, Chrome is not running as root. It's, oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, uh, please, uh, or if you do that. Yeah. Okay. Chrome isn't running as root. Chrome's probably running as you. Okay. But, uh, so, if you notice that, uh, I'll, without going into details of pledge, because you can look at the details on, on the, in the man pages, uh, you'll notice, like, the GPU process can talk to sockets, can talk to DRM. So it can talk to, to pipes and paths. It, it, DRM means it can directly access the DRM device to spit graphics at your screen. Okay? That's a very specific pledge to access a very dangerous thing. <laughs> Most things don't have this. This does. Okay? That's good. It's, it's, it's a graphics engine. This is what it does. Okay? Uh, and it has uh, the ability to map executable memory because things. Don't worry about it. Uh, and it can receive and send if, it receive descriptors and send file descriptors. They all can receive and send file descriptors because these are just these are effectively a privilege separated program, and they're communicating with each other over a pipe. And they actually do things like, hey, I needed that file. They ask somebody that opens the file to hand them a descriptor back, and so they pass file descriptors over sockets. Okay, um, and you'll notice a lot of these things, except the renderer process can read the file system. But all of the API, like this is the thing your JIT plug, your plugins run in. Your plugins can map executable memory because they, they run the plugin. But hey, they can't scribble on the file system. They don't have R path or W path. They can't go do other things themselves. A plugin can ask a master to say, hey, give me the contents of that file. But he can't go do it himself. Okay, that's really cool. And if he tries on OpenBSD, Chrome dies horribly. It gets shot. Okay. Um, the utility process, this is probably, you notice this one has read, create, and write path. Okay? This basically means that process has the ability to reach into the file system. And that'll be the thing that when Chrome, when you say, hey, I want to download, you know, the latest firmware from Intel and save it onto disk, um, there we go. 
that will be the thing that actually opens the file and writes it. So it's still pretty good. A lot of the code in Chrome is running without access to an awful lot of stuff. And if it violates that contract, it'll die. This is good, but it's not perfect. Um, you, as you can probably think, and as I'm hinting there, it takes all the syscalls away. It takes away a lot of nasty space and provides space that if an attacker tries to run an attack, he's going to trip over it. But the utility process can still decide to open my SSH keys and read them and send them to Google. I mean, it's Chrome after all. There might be valuable customer data in those SSH keys that they can sell. Did I say that? Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't. Oh, that, yeah, it's, they want to back up my SSH keys for me. It's SSH keys as a service, yes, <laughs> for sure. That, that's definitely what they want. So it would be really, really nice if Chrome, we still need to let Chrome write things, but there's nothing in Pledge that says, well, Chrome, you know, you really kind of want to write here, but, but I don't want to let you write over here, okay? And so that leads to kind of the next thing that we're doing. Um, Unveil uh, is a new thing. Uh, it's a new system call. Uh, it's not yet in OpenBSD. The diffs are being passed around between a number of people, and it's uh, the culmination of a lot of uh, try, fail, try, fail, try again, fail between Theo, myself, uh, Semery, a whole bunch of people uh, who have been back and forth on this a number of times. Uh, we think we're getting close here, and it will probably uh, be soon. So anyway. Unveil limits file system access. You call it with unveil with a path and flags. And the flags are really, the path is just a file name or a directory name. Uh, the flags are pretty, basically, as soon as you call unveil with a path, so if you call, unveil, if your program starts, you call unveil slash temp. Okay, good. Guess what? Now the only thing your program can see is slash temp. That's it. Okay? Uh, at that point, what will happen, there's a lot of kernel support for it, uh, any access to a path that's not unveiled returns e no ant, like it doesn't exist. So if there's no unveil at all for that path, it returns e no ant. You also pass uh, unveil some flags, and that they, they are one of, or all of, RWXC. They mean kind of what you would expect. Read is for read, write is for write, X is for execute operations, and C is for create or delete operations. We, we do distinguish because you kind of have to. There's been much argument over that. Um, so what ends up happening is you, and if, if there is an unveil for a path, so if I unveil slash temp read write, and then I try to go access, I try to exec a shell script in slash temp, I'm not going to get no end, I'm going to get e access. Okay, now what you might wonder is why am I focusing on that on one slide? <laughs> Remember the little piece that I told you about Pledge. Pledge doesn't alter program behavior. It doesn't make anything change differently. The only way you can fail a Pledge is your program, is if you fail a Pledge, your program gets shot in the head. This is different. Why is that important? Can anybody think of it for me? Why does it matter that I care about what these things return? What's going to happen to the program after it, quote, violates the unveil? No, it's not crashing. But That's the point. It will continue to run. It will continue to run. Oh, shit. Right? Okay. That's extremely important. And this is one of the thing, reasons why we keep working on this and haven't put it in the tree yet. Why is that so important? With pledge, it's straightforward. When you violate a pledge, you're dead. You can't possibly be a security risk, right? But wait, people are stupid and write dumb programs, okay? If all of a sudden the access to the file system that you maybe didn't check the return value correctly, and before it always worked, and now because of an unveil it doesn't, your program is now taking a different path than it did before. Unveil alters behavior. So what we are trying to do and get a good, good bit of confidence for from ourselves is to make sure through doing a lot of programs that by doing this, that behavior, the paths that programs take when they see these failures are expected. And unless the program was already a super hot mess of disaster, okay, it, it's not going to have any worse effects for having been unveiled than it was for not having unveil in it. 
okay? Because what you certainly don't want, you know, you don't want the, oh, look, I couldn't open slash temp. Well, halt and catch fire and spawn a root shell. Um, that you don't want, okay? And, and you, could, you could trigger this behavior by unveil, putting unveil in the program and all of a sudden having the program's behavior change. So again, what we're trying to do is mimic it just like normal conditions it would see in a file system. When your access doesn't match, you get e-access. And hopefully you're checking for things like that and doing the right thing. When the file doesn't exist, you get e no ant. And hopefully you're checking for that and doing the right thing. So that's really, really important. OK. Um, By aborting, a, yes, by aborting a child or mussing with the signal handlers or everything else. There's actually a knob to pledge to make it not do SIG abort. And originally, it, uh, it did SIG kill. Uh, the problem with, with SIG kill is it's really a kind of a bear to debug. Um, and so the default is sitting to SIG abort, which for sane programs don't catch SIG abort and try to do crazy things in a signal handler. So usually, usually it just it goes away. It's dead. The master knows. Oh, it's dead. And it, it goes. It says something bad happened. Yeah. We 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 initially had this was initially not sig abort. It was sig kill, and and gradually we convinced ourselves that sig abort is is probably safe and more importantly it makes it a lot easier to to deal with this stuff and debug. So anyway, uh, back to unveil. When you unveil a directory, like if you call unveil on, on slash temp or slash user, that unveils everything underneath that directory. So it unveils the entire hierarchy in the file system. And it unveils it with the flags associated with that unveil call. So if I unveil slash user, read write, now my program can read or write anything underneath slash user, but it can't execute anything under slash user. It can't create files under slash user by default. If you unveil a non-directory, this is different. Unveiling a non-directory unveils by name, and I'll explain the difference in a minute, and it does it within the containing directory. And that can be a more specific unveil under a more general directory unveil. So I could decide that I'm going to unveil slash user, read write, and I'm going to unveil slash user local, or user local conf, myprogram.conf, read write exec. And that the more specific unveil wins in this case. Okay, now why am I talking about the difference between directories and non-directories? There is a lot of deep support in the kernel for this thing, um, and this is where a lot of the try, fail, try, fail, try, fail happened over the last few years. Um, I haven't said the word yet, but if you looked at early versions of pledge, there was this second argument called path, which is no longer there. And initially, we had great plans to, we were going to have pledged paths, because it was obvious from the front that, hey, we wanted to be able to contain portions of the file system. And so uh, the shirt I'm wearing is from, from the Nant Ports hackathon this year. And, and I think the, the poor porters sat in a room around me and Theo yelling at each other for seven days <laughs> and throwing diffs back and forth at each other. <laughs> and it became a, a pledge hackathon. Um, and the previous ports hackathon as well, we also said, well, this is, just seems like a good time of year to do this. And we also both went to the previous ports hackathon in Nantes a year before, where we worked on pledge path. And it was back and forth, and, and we kept making progress on it. But again, it was, we're just not happy with it. We weren't happy with it because of how the deep support in the kernel worked. And this has to do with the cost and what a program can do when it calls, well, at that time, pledge path, or now unveil. Because at the time, what we were trying to do before is store the paths in the kernel and make sure that we look them up efficiently. And no matter how efficiently you do it, you're still doing lookups and string compares and fun stuff in name I all the time for that program and every program that has also pledged path because of the way we have to do things in the kernel. This means that a, a program can effectively abuse 
pledge path at the time to make the kernel much more expensive for everyone else than itself. And what you want is you want these costs associated with doing this to apply to that process, not to other people's processes, or not costs associated with the kernel that aren't, aren't taken into account for that process, for its cost and its scheduling, and how, how long it gets to run. You effectively don't want to make it where a program doing this can, deny, can DOS everybody else easily. So that was why we, we kept abandoning that way of doing things in PledgePath. Oh, I'll do it more efficiently. OK, yeah. Oh, I'll do this more efficiently. OK, yeah, that's really more efficient, but there's still this problem. Oh. And you know, the discussion went back and forth, and it was, you know, what we really need to do is look up the V nodes and hang on to them. Oh. And, you know, it's, then it's like, you know, it's that classic scene from Indiana Jones where, you know, I'm sitting next to Theo looking in the pit full of V nodes and name I lookups. And they go, oh, V nodes and name lookups. Very dangerous. You go first. I go, yeah, somebody who knows the V nodes and, and the name I lookups should really take that on. And Theo's looking at me and I kind of go, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a year ago. <laughs> And then I'm like, oh, this is going to be horrible. And finally, all right, I, I, I need a, a respite from life. I need to hide for, for a week or three. And I just, hmm, let's see if I can do this with vnodes without having my kernel explode horribly. Because trust me, when you start doing nasty things with vnodes, you, you, you find out very quickly when you violated the rules through glorious panics and crash dumps. Um, but in the end, I, I did get it working, and I haven't actually had this crash much at all, except when I do something really stupid. So um, effectively, how this is working in the kernel is we, ha we do the, when you call unveil, it remembers the directory containing whatever you unveiled. If, the, if that's the directory itself for your unveil, great, it remembers that. Um, if you unveil something that's not a directory, it remembers the directory vnode that it's in and the name that you are unveiling in it. And you wonder, why is this? Because vnodes change any time a file is created or deleted. And one of the most common operations you do on a file that you might want to unveil, is it might be a config file. And what do you do with a config file for a process before you change it? You make a new one. <laughs> you write out the new one. And you switch them atomically. Guess what? That removes and creates the file. Guess what? The vnode changed. Unveil doesn't work anymore if we just keep the vnode. We have to remember the directory you were in Remember the name, and always look up the name when you go, do it, go to do this. Yeah? So the default would be an application that has no unveil would have normal access. An application, but as soon as it calls unveil, first unveil the first unveil, that's it. That's all it has. OK. okay. Now there's some, there's some cheats. OK. You can still unveil other things after that. Yeah, so it's, you, you can do multiple unveils. You can do multiple unveils. Yes, that works fine. OK. The other things that effectively cheat without you having to know is pledge under the covers. So for example, and, and I, I'll give you, give you a concrete example from pledge itself. If you pledge with no R path, W path, or C path uh, in, in pledge, you can't access any files in the file system. Pledge will shoot you in the head. OK, so forget unveil for a minute. But if you pledge DNS, it'll actually still let you look at etsyresolve.conf. Right. Even though you don't have any file system access, only through the library calls that do it, you may access resolve.conf and do DNS resolution. So there are some behind the scenes cheats in pledge to make pledge usable. There is deep support in the kernel to handle this and understand it. And it's the same thing with unveil. So that kind of cheat for DNS. So if I had pledged nothing, or if I had unveiled myself away, but I still pledged DNS, I would still be able to use DNS resolution. It cheats. And it's a good thing that it cheats. We know that there are no stupid users of OpenBSD. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, have you read MISC lately? Then that's gone. You, you lose. You're fucked. <laughs> Hi, you did something dumb. It's just going to show up because it's not there. And it's actually even the current iteration of the man page explicitly warns you about this. It's like, hey, it's a directory. If you start monkeying with the directory structure, it's not going to remember it. It's basically these things are, are, are remembered at the time of lookup. If you change it between time of lookup and time of use, it's just not going to work. It's going to fail, you know, and you lose. That's okay. 
you know, we keep thinking about that, and for the most part, we think that's okay. We can accept that behavior. But that's okay. It, it, sure, it could, because I mean, even without unveil, I could just be stupid and go remove, <laughs> remove my stuff over here and leave the program running, and it goes, I don't know, it, guess what Guess what the program gets when I do that? It gets enoant. Well, guess what it gets when I do that with unveil? It gets enoant. So it's really no different. Fundamentally, that's what you have to do, otherwise you introduce the possibility of time objectors and have huge problems. And we really don't want to go there. And, and you know, it sounds like oh, you're 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 dodging on the corner case that you know would be so important. But it, but you think it's so important from an ivory tower point of view, and then you go look at how real programs do this, and it's not. This is not a, a hindrance to using it effectively. Oh yeah, stupid X. <laughs> Again, I, I really I really hope that I'm I really hope that I'm behind the line in hell for pineapples. When I go there, behind the guy who wrote X-Randar. So I get to watch. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, oops. When I did that, it did this. There we go. OK. So there's also a new play. So I've, I've mentioned that you know, there's a lot of deep support in the kernel for this and how we're doing it. And there is a new pledge for Unveil that comes with this. Because guess what? You want to be able to tell programs, even though we say you can keep calling Unveil, we want to be able to tell programs you can't call unveil. <laughs> we want to be able to take it away with pledge. So it is very usable in the OpenBSD base today. Uh, we have a, a big patch that we're feeding around from me and Theo and others that have about 40 odd programs unveiled with usable unveils that actually seem to work. They seem to make things safer and the, the programs work fine and, and, and do the right thing. Um, and uh, a lot of utilities in SBIN, uh, little things like, uh, oh god, but, uh, 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 the thing that tells you you have new mail classically. Why do, why do I never remember it? Yeah. Biff. Uh, you know, Biff is pledged. <laughs> or Biff is pledged and unveiled. Um, it will, <laughs> it, it can only look at your mail spool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems silly, and, and it's it, you, you kind of laugh, but we get experience by doing this, and this is how we, we decide the API is right, by doing these simple little programs that start working up with, oh, well, this is a user's mail stuff. I want to restrict it only to that user. Is this API workable for this? Can I use this as a programmer? Can I use this Machiavellian horror that I've developed in the kernel as a user land programmer and it, it, it doesn't make my head go stupid. It doesn't make my brain explode. And it's something that I can actually understand and use effectively in lots of different classes of programs. That's what we've done with Pledge. And that's what we're trying to do with this. Because we want to get the semantics right before we really let everybody try it. It often ends up being right before the Pledge. Oh, why? It's not really surprising. If you think about, we've started to restructure all of our programs in base because of pledge to do the big thing here and then reduce and do more things and reduce. It's the same kind of places in a program where you say, oh, hey, I'm opening a ton of config files and doing a lot of things. Oh, I, I either didn't unveil or I unveiled a wide set. Oh, now I'm, I'm just going to unveil you know, my downloads directory and I'm done. And then I keep moving. Yes, you can. But you can't do an unveil temp RWX and then do unveil temp RWXC. That won't be allowed. <laughs> yeah, you can't, just like pledge, you can continue to call and reduce, but you can never escalate. Okay? That's, that's the really important thing. And it, unfortunately, that's one of the things that when I say the dirty word sandboxing, a lot of the other sandboxing methods don't get. They don't trust the programmer to make decisions. They want to make one big set, and you have to make that big set work. The result is, for real programs, that big set is very big for the whole life of the program. And as you've seen, you can take Unix programs, and you can make sure they're not written that way. You can do the, exp do the heavy lifting up front, and then put the program into a mode where, for most of its lifetime, and a lot of its attack exposure to other things, it is doing much less stuff. And that's good. So, it often shows up right before Pledge, and sometimes this, just like Pledge, has said, oh, hey, you know, we can hoist code. 
if I just do this up here, it doesn't change the behavior of the program, and then I can, I can be much more restrictive in what I've unveiled further on for the rest of the life of the program. And so we've seen a few cases like that as well. And so again, as we bring these APIs in, we're looking at code and saying, oh, look, hey, I can make this better. And it, yeah. Well, so in real life, what you're doing is you're giving the programmer a way of cobbling together their own view of the, of the file system. It, it's, it's kind of their own view of the file system, but effectively, it's, it's similar to Pledge. Right. It is, hey, I'm promising that right. this is all I'm going to do in the file system in the well, future. It's better than C true, because as a programmer, I have no idea. <laughs> you're, what yeah, you have no idea what you're getting into. <laughs> As, well, as long as your choices, as long as what your program does matches your choices, right. your program gets to see the file system. Unlike Pledge, if your choices don't right. match, they just don't appear to be there or it appears to be permission denied. Yeah. That's that, this is much nicer. So, it, well, it, it kind of is. Okay. It's not quite the holy grail yet. Uh, we, it is, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, when will it be available? Probably one more refactor of the internal implementation. Um, a, a lovely, lovely friend of mine named uh, Sebastian, uh, who is uh, one of our, our, our more interesting developers. He's really good at reading diffs. And he's really good at being picky about implementation. And he, he gave me a lovely review of my latest iteration and brought up a few really core concerns, the kinds of things that even Theo and I missed looking at diffs. And I'm like, yeah, OK, I need to refactor this this way so I can handle a case internally for threading and locking them in the kernel. Um, it's, it's not bad, but it's just going to take me a little time to do. It, it's definitely doable. Um, so I do need to do a little bit of a refactor and feed that past him again. Um, we have the, the, now, the now infamous Theo's, it, it, it's like every rule of Theo's, it's arbitrary and communicated verbally, but it's usually right. Um, <laughs> Theo's arbitrary 50 programs rule before anything like this goes in. And, and we're, we're very near 50 programs, and I could cheat in about 20 minutes and get to 50 programs, but I don't want to. Um, is basically, this was kind of the, the benchmark before we, the pledge got into the kernel, is that the, actually got committed, is we were able to usefully use it on 50 programs in base. And say, hey, okay, yeah, we've now used this on a wide enough variety of programs that we believe in the semantics. And trust me, at, at Nant, this is part of the yelling back and forth in the room while everybody else you know, had to listen, because I'm kind of loud. Um, was the, hey, we, we tried another program. Oh, look, and, and, now we, and now we tried another program, and this sucks. We want that different. Uh, I'm going to make that different. New diff. Oh, uh, that's better. Oh, look, but there's this case. That sucks. Uh, oh, we don't like the fact that we're using these flags. Let's use different flags. We changed the API probably 20 times in a week, <laughs> you know, significantly, <laughs> as we started doing more and more programs. Because you always start one of these things and you think, yeah, that's cool. And then it's like, oh, well, it pinches a bit here, and it doesn't quite fit a bit here. And that's, that's how we're taking an approach to this. And so it, like fine wine, it will go in uh, for its time. We will know it's right when we can do Chrome. Because honestly, the holy grail for Unveil is I can start bloody Chrome, and Chrome can only write my downloads directory. It cannot read my SSH keys. It cannot write to my SSH keys. That's what I want this for. I'm selfish. I want this for me. Yeah? Let's say we had to unveil the entire user directory for a way to then limit access to the SSH keys that are contained there. Yeah, because remember, the most specific unveil wins. So if I unveil slash user, uh, let's say, read, write, execute, and then I go unveil dollar home slash back slash dot SSH, nothing, that, that, that works. <laughs> Okay, and you get nothing. <laughs> you can knock things out by play, by unveiling nothing. So, and that 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 will work. And I've tried that. That was that was one of the things where oh shit, we need to do that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> change how it works again. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it, it really was. And so we've been through a lot of that. But back to you know what we really want to do. We know it's right when we can take the way Chrome is currently pledged and probably at the same place as we pledge it add stuff in there to actually uh, unveil it so that those worker processes in Chrome that can t actually touch the file system aren't allowed to touch all of the file system. Yep. What kind of success have, have the project had upstreaming pledges so that people leave them in and we don't have to maintain massive diffs? Pretty good because what ends up happening is the ports guys are, are first of all, heroic individuals because they do upstream our diffs. 
The second thing is both Unveil and Pledge are really, really easy to have portable versions because it's simply pound define pledge right. zero, pound define unveil zero. Right. So if you're on Linux or if you're on FreeBSD, it does nothing. It just compiles, right it just compiles but it's there. Okay. The, the fascinating thing, which I have seen from some people, is they look at patches upstream from OpenBSD that have pound define pledge zero, and then they're doing, oh god, I, well, they're doing <coughs> SE Linux. And they look at this and realize that if it runs that, then they figure out how to write their SE Linux policy. Because <laughs> that's a fucking nightmare. So, but yeah, it's a hint. And it's a hint from the programmer's point of view of how this thing works and how this program is expected to work. So just because it doesn't do anything on other, on other platforms that don't support Pledge and Unveil, that's harmless. You can, you can happily unveil it. It's no more than a little if def open BSD. And it doesn't even need to be if deft, it would just be pound defined. So. Okay, uh, so it'll probably show up in OpenBSD 6.4 as long as I make sure I, I stop slacking long enough to do the refactor that I want to do and convince Theo that it's sane and convince Semery that it's sane. I think Theo is no longer the gate. He's discovered it usually works. Now it's Semery. Semery is the, is, the, is the acid test. So, anyway. There's one other thing that is also in pledge, switching back to pledge, and that's pledge exec promises. So when we did pledge up front, uh, one of the things you might notice about other cough, cough, sandboxing techniques is they like to make restrictions for everything that runs at this process and everything else underneath. Because pledge is designed as the programmer is making the choice and the promises in their program, the initial versions of pledge had no way to take a pledge from a process to when it calls exec and makes a different process. So an initial program that was pledged, as long as it had pledge exec and could, is allowed to exec another program, that other program execs and that program actually starts with no pledges. Because it's assumed that if that program is also pledged, that programmer will do the right thing and appropriately restrict the program and, and pledge it. But that doesn't give us the ability to say, hey, I want this program and anything it execs, because I have to give it the ability to exec things, to have, still have some restrictions. So it would be nice if we could trust the program to always do the right thing, but I actually want to be able to put a, some, some overarching promises so that it starts not with completely open. It starts with a set that we can use. And so that is exec promises. And for this, it's, it's essentially a set of pledges that when you exec, that child process will then start with, okay? Which sounds simple enough, but it's really tricky. You now get into all of those problems that you have with other sandboxing techniques, where remember how we said programs love to start with a why, they have to do a lot of really important things up front to set themselves up, and then they go down to this, this compact loop where they actually do their work, and they're not doing all that setup work you trip over the fact that you wanted to start something and it had to do this wide arranging set of things. So pledge exec promises today, it's, it works. It spe specify pledge promises for future exec children, but it's kind of hard to use. Okay, and we've discovered that it's kind of hard to use. And what it really needs is it really needs to combine, be combined with unveil so that you can actually combine uh, not only a promise for what that child process will pledge, but also for what you'll let it unveil. So you don't start with a, a free unveil, you start with it's already restricted, okay? And so we need to get a little bit more experience with real programs and unveil ourselves before we are comfortable that we're gonna get the right semantic here and make this easy to use. Because it really does come down to this method has to be easy to use for regular programmers. It is useless to say the programmer is going to make the big monstrous horror and then a separate team is going to go measure it and come up with ways to contain it. Because I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen in my professional life. I know it's bullshit. It never works. Okay? Or it, it, it works, but it's, it's far from perfect. The program is far less contained than it is if you do it this way. Uh, oh, I guess I'm getting, I've been a little ahead of myself. Fortunately, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so, unveil exec promises, then what? 
Stargazing down the road, and, and Theo convinced me to put this slide in. I didn't want to. Because <laughs> it's making an extravagant promise. Flowers, chocolates, promises you don't intend to keep. Uh, <laughs> my wife's here, I can say that. <laughs> yeah, you hear it a lot, I know. <laughs> um, so stargazing down the road, uh, we can look at it, we know we really have it right when we can combine all of those things together and make an actual pledge one, a pledge command, okay? If we could actually make a pledge command to say, hey, here's the paths I'm going to let you get at, here's the promises for pledge that you're going to start with, and here's the command that you're going to run. So the day we can do that, it would be really cool. Uh, you could pledge make build. We'd really like to do that. Uh, pledge make build. Pledge make build is interesting because, you know, Theo is paranoid. Um, I'm less paranoid about make build because probably I foolishly trust my OpenBSD developer companions more than I should. The one I really want to uh, pledge is pledge make ports because, yes, 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 yes. holy fuck, there's a lot of autoconf in there. <laughs> and I don't trust any of that stuff. Um, so such things are probably a little ways away, I, you know years, uh, but it's, it's nice to have goals. Um, you never know, it might not be years if we really get Unveil right. Somebody might come up with, with wild, a wild diff to just do this, but it'd be cool. Anyway, um, and uh, so just to summarize, it's, it's all about making big things safer, okay? So pledge and Unveil, I, I, I don't like graphic slides, but I always have one graphic. So anyway, um, it's all about making big things safer. Uh, Pledge and Unveil are designed to make big programs safer. It applies to multiple different sorts of programs. Privilege separated, privilege drop, and even unprivileged programs. It lets us take those techniques we do elsewhere and start bringing them into programs that do not have the ability to uh, run SAT UID. Uh, it's easy to use and learn compared to many other techniques. Um, when the, the massive pledge-a-thon started in base, it was not just Theo doing it. It was all of our developers. People looked at this and rapidly figured out, hey, this is cool, and this is something I can take a program that I maintain, learn in an hour, and re refactor my program to deal with it properly. And a lot of people started doing it. It's really, really cool. Well, it's also been brought into a lot of languages. Like, uh, yeah, there's been, there's, Go and Haskell, Haskell have pledge support because there's a few people in Go and Haskell land that are OpenBSDers and say, hey, this is pretty cool. And when I run this stuff on OpenBSD, I would really like to pledge my Go program. So, um, and be again, because in all the other languages, it just, it just does nothing. <laughs> so it's, it's harmless. <laughs> yeah, it does, uh, it's designed to make even really complex things safer. Because program complexity is something we'll never get away from completely. OpenSSH, HTTPD, uh, Acme client, the, hey, I'm going to go talk to Let's Encrypt, and boy, I'm going to trust them a lot. Uh, surely nobody will ever hack at Let's Encrypt and put evil stuff in there to compromise everybody that talks to it. Um, Chrome is our holy grail. I really want Chrome to be good. All the stuff that we use frequently, that you use frequently on a desktop, that you will be targeted by for the fact, very fact that you're using that program, and attackers can look on the network and see you using that program. And even OpenSSL 1, and those of you who were subjected to me yesterday heard all my ranting about friends don't let friends use the OpenSSL command in production. And God, God kills a bag of kittens every time somebody exposes the OpenSSL command to input from the internet. Um, but having said that, OpenSSL on, uh, uh, the OpenSSL command on OpenBSD is actually pledged. It is, you know, if you remember the OpenSSL command, you want to talk about Swiss Army knives? That's the Swiss Army toilet. And there, there are, there are sh the entire Swiss Army uses it, and there are 50 holes. There are 50 different ways to run OpenSSL. They are all separate binaries that it execs, and they all have different pledges. Fortunately, most of them look like standard IO, RPath, WPath, which does contain it a fair bit but you still shouldn't let expose it to the internet. It really is the Swiss Army toilet. Um, and so it's, even that's pledged to OpenBSD. And it, it does add some safety. Remember, there are no silver bullets. It, nothing is perfect. Um, questions? 
Ask me anything. I done. I'm over time. Yeah. Uh, oh God, who's first? At the front. So Fletch has the philosophy of shoot it if it does the wrong thing, and Unveil has the philosophy of report an error if it does the wrong thing. No, it's not report an error. Unveil has the philosophy of make it appear that it didn't right. exist, Ma make it make it look normal, right. pretend it's not there, or that you don't have permission to access it. In the way of an error code. Yeah. So why the two different philosophies? I can see either one, but why one for one and the other for the other? Uh, because what ends up happening in a lot of these programs that you're containing file system access is they actually do try to open things outside of what you might expect. If I have to pledge the program to, let's say, only, you know, because a lot of times what will happen is a program will say, hey, do I have this? Do I have a directory here? Do I have a directory here? Things call stat. Things walk the file system. And if you tried to take real programs and make it where I'm going to make a useful method to contain this that a programmer can use, whereas every time they call stat they shouldn't, they get shot in the head, th what they're going to do is they're going to have to make that promise a lot wider so that the program doesn't get shot in the head. And that's not what you want. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> And it says that doesn't exist. No, now the directory exists, but it's empty. Yeah. And you go all the way back to the slash, and it's empty. But if you go back to that directory, there's your files. OK. And if you go to slash temp, you can see files there. Because things walk the file system. Okay. Things go up and down. They disappear. So, so the user can, can look around and it's not kill the program. It's not secure. You're still rooted in slash. Right. If, if you actually shot the user, that's probably the interesting thing to say. It's probably the interesting thing. If you actually shot the program in the head when you violated it, you'd effectively have the same usability to a programmer as to root, which, which is nice, but is, it has its limitations. It actually means that someone who breaks into your Chrome can download your EPT resolve.com. Oh, drat. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear that on the recording, it, 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 it means, it, see what Theo said was, it means if somebody breaks into Chrome and it's unveiled, they could possibly download your resolve.conf. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, I mean, one, I'd say love it because when I do something like SE Linux, I'm the unsophisticated end user. So I'm not write, writing all my own stuff. So my solution is what did they program for me or this didn't work and their answer is turn off SE Linux. So I'm really happy with this option. I'm already relying on the program. You just described 99% of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you read on the slide here, Chrome is pledged. Yeah. Um, but the port street's huge. Yeah. So let's say I want to be a little bit less like a two year old and I want to choose programs because there's many options. You know, what media player should I use? Is there a way for me to know which ones are starting to pledge or not pledge so I can make slightly wider decisions? Grep, grep minus R pledge user ports. Not real. No, they're not. Yeah, kind of. In, in the port tree, they all have a comment saying pledge. Okay. In there, it is. In the make file. In, in the make file. Yeah. So it's it's there. So for the maintainer, as a note to, oh yes, there's a pledge here. Let's so double check. When I update a piece of software, they may have completely revamped the entire initialization, and now the program's broken. But the note before that, do it more pledge. I'm just thinking, you know, do I do XMMS for VLC? I want to put it into three files. Could I decide? Could I figure out? Uh, Look. Touching pace is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At the back. Um, you have just one, uh, if you're the next speaker, please kick me out. I am not the next. Whoever is the next speaker, please kick me out. They're, they keep asking questions. Yes. Will you use just a pledge command to unveil and pledge, or are you considering to have two commands and they could? It, it will be two commands because it is now two system calls. Initially, they were the same. And this was another one of the things that, oh shit, we need to change this. It was obvious that there are some programs that you actually can't pledge because they want to do really nasty things that we will never allow in pledge, but it's still useful to be able to unveil in them. So we actually may unveil as a separate system call for pledge. It is, it's complementary and they all will often get used together, but they are completely separate and they can be used independently.
You, you can make selective unveils depending on what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's, it's a separate command just like pledge. Yeah. I, I, we're out of time and people are going to be mad at me for going over. So thank you very much.